your Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining AWM uh, uh, seminar. Today we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Rebecca Durs. She's from Brown University. Uh, her topic is loosely coupled time splitting methods based on Robin Robin interface condition. Our second speaker is Kira Pien. Uh, she's a PhD student from University of Pittsburgh. Her topic is uh, on the Randall Como Group One Equation Model. So please, Rebecca, you can go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. It's really exciting to be able to, to join you all here for this, um, this talk. Uh, as Fariana says, uh, my name is Rebecca Durst. I'm a PhD candidate at Brown University. I work with Johnny Guzman, uh, and I will actually be uh, coming to Pitt as a postdoc next year. So I'm really excited to join your community and share with you the work I've been doing. Um, this work is on uh, loosely coupled time splitting methods based on Robin Robin interface conditions. And it's joint work with my advisor, Johnny Guzman at Brown, and our collaborators, Eric Berman at University College London and Miguel Fernandez at INRIA Paris. So this talk is going to be organized in the same way that the research happened. So it's mostly, this is my a lot of my thesis work in this talk. And I'm doing that because I think it's a very nice progression for the, the research. And I also think it's really, there's a lot of value in showcasing the research process. So I hope that you will enjoy that. So we'll begin with describing the fluid structure interaction system, which is the main system motivating the work, uh, the initial project and the motivations. And then we'll talk about the, the first results we got from this project. So this would be the first results that I had for my thesis work and the next steps from that. And then this project actually ended up kind of surprising us a lot and talk about what happened when we hit that interesting surprise and the consequences that came from that. So we'll start with the system. The fluid structure interaction system is exactly as it sounds. It's a fluid interacting with a structure. And you can think of, for this problem, you can think of a 2D system, which uh, is sort of like the cross section of a pipe or a blood vessel, which is oftentimes the problem that we're kind of thinking of when working on this. And you have an inflow boundary and, and an outflow boundary and this fluid domain omega f. And on top and bottom is our solid domain omega s, and they're separated by an interface sigma. So that's kind of the structure you want to keep in mind throughout this talk. Uh, these are governed by these two equations. We have in the fluid domain, the Stokes equations with incompressibility, and we have, it's, it's just linear. Uh, and for the solid domain, we have the linear elasticity equations on the bottom here. For U is the fluid velocity, P is the pressure, and eta is the um, structural displacement. We're keeping things linear because we want to kind of work with the, the most basic model first and then build our way up to other models. And we're also assuming that the structure kind of only undergoes infinitesimal displacements. It's still interacting with the fluid, but it's not going wild. So we can assume our interface is static. And this turns out to be a, um, a, a pretty reasonable simplification. Um, here I have uh, sigma F and sigma S, which represent the fluid and solid stress tensors. Um, notice that the fluid stress depends on both the velocity and the pressure, and it encodes information about the um, viscosity mu. And the solid stress tensor or strain rate tensor uh, just depends on eta, and it encodes information about the elasticity. That's what L1 and L2 are our limit parameters. They tell us kind of how bendy our structure is. Um, and for blood flow problems, those can be really large. They can be on the order of 10 to the six. And finally, rho F and rho S are our fluid and solid densities. So obviously this is an interaction system. So we need some way for these two systems of equations to interact with each other. And that happens at the interface sigma, where we have two interface conditions or coupling conditions. Um, in this case, we have a kinematic and a dynamic coupling condition. The kinematic condition is our um, is a Dirichlet type interface condition, and it tells us that the velocity of the fluid and the velocity of the structure are equal at the interface, which means that the two domains stay flush together. We don't have random pockets of nothing uh, occurring in between the at the interface between the solid and the fluid. And the second condition, called the, the dynamic coupling condition is a Neumann type interface condition. 
And it tells us, it's basically Newton's laws of motion. It tells us that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the force that the fluid is enacting on the solid is matched by the force of the solid on the fluid. So we just have kind of equal and opposite forces. And that's given by the stress tensors kind of adding and canceling in that normal direction. All right, and so these are really critical, these conditions, because they they create the interaction. And they also really are, they, they are a result of the physics of the system. So we want to keep them as um, consistent as possible because if we break them, we're breaking physics. And we don't wanna break physics too much. We will end up having to though. So my goal for these equations is, is not to find an exact solution. I don't wanna spend my time doing that. I think it will you know, significantly reduce my lifespan if I spend years just trying to find an exact solution for these equations. I wanna find a numerical solution. Uh, so I want to solve an approximation at discrete points in time and space that converge to the exact solution. I'm not going to spend much time in this talk or any time talking about the spatial discretization. I will use finite element method for that. And I do have two, two or three slides about them uh, if you have questions after. But really, I care in this talk about the time discretization and the time approximation because my systems are evolving in time. And so I want to solve them for discrete time steps. And I really want efficiency. I, more than anything else, I want this, my method to be efficient. I want what's called a loose or an explicit coupling, uh, which means that I can solve for the fluid and solid systems uh, separately and sequentially by passing information across the interface. So for example, I would solve for the solid first, then I would use interface coupling conditions to take that solid solution, pass it to the fluid, and then solve the fluid. This is really efficient because I can use existing solvers and I'm just, I'm solving smaller systems in a sequence, it's like an assembly line, but it suffers from a massive problem. That problem is kind of interchangeably called the added mass effect or the added mass instability as I prefer to call it. And it states that for any explicit coupling of that FSI system that I would create using those Dirichlet-Neumann coupling conditions, because you have to use the coupling conditions to create that assembly line effect. Uh, there will exist a limiting density ratio between the, the fluid and solid densities beyond which the scheme is unconditionally unstable, which is you know, a terrible result. We can't use it. This is a huge issue, especially in hemodynamics and blood flow problems, because the density of blood and blood vessels tend to be really similar. And it tends to be that those problems end up within that range. Um, and so a lot of people have to try and find a solution to that. The solution is either to use a monolithic method, which is the opposite of a loosely coupled method. You solve everything in the system all at once, which is less efficient and also means that I'd have to kind of create a new solver for each problem rather than using pre-existing fluid and solid solvers that I might already have. Um, or alternatively, people put a pressure jump at the interface that's kind of uh, counteract the instability, but that tends to affect your accuracy. And so it's not also, also kind of not ideal. So our collaborators, uh, Eric and Miguel, were working on this problem. And in 2014, they proposed using replacing the Dirichlet and Neumann conditions with Robin type interface conditions. Um, and they found that this was nice and stable, but they were still using a pressure jump to stabilize. However, their uh, numerical experiments suggested the pressure jump was not necessary. They were just using it in their proof to be able to prove stability, but it wasn't needed. It turned out in the numerical experiments. So Johnny and I joined them and I started my thesis and we were, we started working on this Robin Robin scheme as we call it. And we found that uh, we were actually able to prove stability without the pressure jump. And we even provide a, an error estimate before I dive into those results, just to show you these Robin type interface conditions. Let's look at the um, Dirichlet Neumann conditions we would use. If we were to create a loose coupling using the Dirichlet Neumann interface conditions, it might look something like this, where if I were, for example, to solve the solid first, I could use that second equation to set in um, a Neumann type interface condition or boundary condition on that interface for the solid system using that information from the previous time step that I already know and solve for the solid that way. I would then use that solution for the solid and the first equation that you see here as a Dirichlet uh, boundary condition on the interface for the fluid system and then solve the fluid. And that would create that assembly line effect for the loose coupling. 
And that's, but that, however, has the added mass instability issue. And the reason for that is I've broken the physics by splitting that second equation up across time steps. And that kind of creates a, an instability if you're within that right kind of density ratio. So instead we use Robin type interface conditions, which will still give us a nice loose coupling. So you can see that first equation is going to be defined. I can set that as a Robin interface condition for my solid and solve it using inf information I already know, and then pass it to the fluid using another Robin interface condition and solve the fluid that way. And you can think of these as like linear combinations of those Dirichlet-Neumann conditions, kind of controlled by that parameter alpha. And these are unconditionally stable. So it's really nice. Um, here's to see it in our time splitting method, a, a different way of seeing it. I first have the solid equation and then the fluid equations. And I've applied these Robin type interface conditions on each. And note that I only need information from the previous time step to solve for the solid. And then once I have that solution, I can just pass it right to the fluid and solve it in a lovely sequence, super efficient. Uh, the key to the stability, it turns out being that you can rewrite those Robin interface conditions. You can take what I have here and rewrite them so that on the left hand and add them together, this is a little bit of rearranging you have to do. And you get on the left hand side here, you end up with those original dynamic and kinematic coupling conditions, which if I was working with the exact solution, not my approximate solution, would be equal to zero on the right hand side. But now with the Robin interface, so the Robin type coupling method, you end up with this these time differences on the right hand side. And it turns out we can control those. Those are, those are quantities that we're able to control in our stability proof. And that's the key kind of to, to proving the stability of the Robin, Robin uh, splitting method as we call it. So that's our little key to stability. This does mean that we have to be careful when we do our spatial discretization because we've got our velocity kind of set equal to a derivative of our, our velocity. So you need to approach that carefully so that you can kind of keep your continuity working. But I'm gonna put that to the side for now and refer you to our um, publications so you can see exactly how that works. So which means I'm gonna skip over these next few slides. So this never happened. I'll skip straight to our um, results. Uh, as I said, it's unconditionally stable and it's encoded here in this long statement of stability. Basically our energy norm does not grow with time and there's no need for a pressure stabilization. So it's really nice. And this is the first provably stable, loosely coupled uh, time stepping method for the fluid structure interaction problem, which is so it's really exciting. And there's, um, there's another group at um, uh, Notre Dame who's also working on a very, very similar problem, have gotten similar results. So I also want to point out their work. It's really exciting to know that you know, someone else is just as excited about this problem as I am. Um, we also, as I said, have an error estimate in our original work that um, for this time stepping method, and we cared mostly about the error in time. So we compared the solution from our Robin, Robin splitting method to the uh, continuous problem. And unfortunately, that only got us square root of delta T in convergence. So our error converges to the exact solution at a rate of square root of delta T. There are no conditions on the physical parameters or the discretization parameters, so that's quite nice, but that's suboptimal. So I'm very excited about stability only to kind of pull you back a bit to say, it's not converging as fast as you might seem. And that's as good as we thought we could do for the time being. And we thought that because our numerical experiments seemed to back that up. We test, this was tested um, by Miguel Fernandez and Eric Berman on um, a problem very, very similar to a, a blood flow problem. And um, they were getting half order convergence. Uh, as you can see, that, that red line is our method compared to a first order method. And it looks very close to half order. So that's about as good as we thought we could do. And it also is consistent with other similar methods. So at least, but we got results and we proved what we thought we set out to prove. But there's some more. My thesis didn't end there. At this point, I thought, okay, I've got a suboptimal method. I would like to at least get first order. If I could do that, my thesis complete, very happy. So that was my goal. And to do that, um, we decided to take a step back and look at a simpler uh, system. So instead of looking at the Stokes elastic problem, we looked at um, two simpler systems. The first being what I call a parabolic-parabolic coupled system, 
where I couple two parabolic equations across an interface. So I'm still working on that omega f and omega s domain. Um, and this is a simplified version of the Stokes elastic because Stokes looks a lot like this parabolic problem, except now my stress term is much simpler and I no longer have a pressure term or a incompressibility condition. I also looked at a parabolic hyperbolic coupling where I do the same thing, except on omega s, I impose a parabolic system because that is much more similar to the elasticity equations. And so these are kind of simplified versions of that Stokes elastic problem. And the idea is if we can get some results on these, they should translate nicely to the FSI problem. So we also impose really similar boundary conditions to the FSI problem on these systems. As you can see, the boundary conditions, especially in the case of the parabolic hyperbolic, look a lot like the FSI system, it's just simplified which means that we can take these and we can apply our Robin-Robin interface conditions, which we do. So um, this is the kind of unified system. Sorry, I forgot to mention, we apply the Robin-Robin, but the other advantage to this is we can actually represent it all as one system. I got a bit ahead of myself there. Um, I love this problem because we were skeptical this would work and it does. I took those parabolic, hyperbolic, and parabolic, parabolic systems, and I can represent them all as one using this parameter k. And if k equals one, I'm going to recover a parabolic equation in that second system of equations uh, because that second line is just going to become redundant. And because you know q will just equal w. And uh, if I, if k equals two, I'm going to recover a, a hyperbolic system in that second system of equations. And it turns out I can do my entire analysis just using this parameter k to differentiate them. So I only had to do one proof. In reality, I actually did like three attempts, but it was like I did them separately and then I put them together. But in our paper, it's only as one. So it's really nice. That's a little side comment. But we did all of our analysis on this unified system where we apply our Robin interface conditions just like the FSI problem. And you can see here, the Robin interface conditions look a lot like they did for the fluid structure problem but now I've got simpler versions of the stress and I have this parameter K kind of differentiating between the two systems. So with that, we had some expectations and then we had to face some realities. So our first expectation was that we would get unconditional stability, just like we had with the fluid structure problem. If we applied the Robin-Robin interface conditions to the parabolic and hyperbolic systems, because we thought the stability was gonna be just a fact of the Robin Robin conditions. And that was what we saw. So we weren't, you know, we weren't thrown for loop yet. It was nice, unconditionally stable. And then we thought we'd also get half order convergence, just like we did for fluid structure problems, at least for the parabolic hyperbolic coupling, because it's so similar. So this we, we expected to see suboptimality. Uh, that wasn't quite what we saw though. We, we kind of had a little bit of a surprise. It, so we ran our, um, our own numerical simulations on Phoenix. And we found for the parabolic, parabolic case, we actually were getting nearly first order or first order convergence. We were really surprised. But we thought, okay, maybe parabolic, parabolic is just too simple. Maybe we just simplified it a little bit too much. And it has to do with that. It's the hyperbolic system that's gonna give us that half order convergence when you, when you pair it with Robin type interface conditions. So we said, okay, code parabolic, hyperbolic. And we did. And we found the same thing. We saw first order, or nearly first order, which was wild. We thought something was wrong with our code. We checked it a million times. And finally thought maybe our test problem is too simple. So the question is, can we prove this? Because if we can prove it, then our test problem is not too simple. We're seeing reality. So could we prove it? Um, yeah. yeah, we proved it. It was really nice. We got a nice proof. Here are our error terms that you can, I recommend looking at our paper if you want to see them in detail, because it's a lot of random letters on a page. And we found our result that our uh, scheme converges um, as kind of order delta t times this one plus log one over delta t, which is effectively very close to one in the limit. Um, that's nearly first order, we were able to prove, which is really exciting. Um, it wasn't simple to prove this result, uh, we have to have a lot of assumptions to prove it. The first two assumptions being not unreasonable, you need small enough time step and you need sufficient regularity. But we also need to 
be able to extend one of our functions from the interface into the interior in order to prove our um, error estimate. Um, and we need to do it in a really specific way. We first need to be able to extend our normal, um, our normal vector into the interior, which isn't a big deal if you have a nice smooth interface. It might get a bit weird if you've got a really wacky interface, um, but for most cases you have a nice kind of a smooth one. Um, you also need this function phi that uh, acts as like a pseudo lifting operator to move from the interface into the interior while being in the proper function spaces. And phi has to have a lot of um, properties such as it needs to be zero on the boundary that isn't the interface. It also needs to be between zero and one so it doesn't take the function from the interface and kind of make it larger. It, needs, so it can't make that function get bigger. Um, it also needs to be close enough to like um, to a step function where uh, if you restrict it back onto the interface, you from on most of the interface you recover the uh, function that you're lifting into the interior. Um, and you'll see what I mean in a second. And you also need phi to not grow. Sorry, to we need it to decay. You need it to go to zero because it needs to be zero on the rest of the interface but you can't have it decay too quickly. You have to be very specific about that. You need it to decay according to that one plus log of one over delta T in order to get the results that you want. It seems like a lot to ask, but we actually are able to construct an example of phi. Um, and is, it will give us this nice lifting operator that is the key to our proof for error analysis. So it's not a trivial um, proof at all. Uh, but we were we initially my advisor was able to to show this for a for a special case and then I extended it to the general case so it does work for very general um, domains and here's an example though on a very simple domain the top of my square on the left here uh, or right I don't know how it switched depending on your screen is sigma at interface and phi needs to be zero on the rest of the boundary and you'll see that on k two I've set phi equal to one, so that on most of the interface, phi equals one, except for a little, little bit on the sides, and that's about size delta t is that kind of region where it's not equal to one. So it's going to, when you multiply it by, uh, it ends up being a residual um, of, in our error analysis, um, you're gonna recover that function on the interface. And then in the immediate area around the interface, phi is equal to these two functions, which decay like one plus log of one over delta t. So you get decay, but not too quickly within that region. And uh, so that's the region around the interface. And you don't really care what happens everywhere else. You just kind of let it get to zero at the base of the domain. So phi exists. We can create one and you can use this phi to construct more complicated phi's for like slightly more complicated domains. If you're for example, if your if your interface is not a straight line, so it's a lot of assumptions. So what I have here is a lot of assumptions in order to get this nice result, but it's not super unreasonable because we can do it in many cases. So why is the FSI system suboptimal then? If the parabolic hyperbolic system is op is nearly optimal, and it's so similar, why is it? Why are we not getting the same results? What we thought of a lot of different things. We thought maybe there's just some differences between the two that we weren't accounting for. For example, the incompressibility condition, which is a result of conservation of mass. So maybe we're violating that too much. Um, or maybe it's the pressure term, which is often, it, we already know we had to, a lot of people used to use a pressure jump to stabilize it. So maybe the pressure term is causing our issues. Uh, and it turns out the answer uh, is very surprising that the FSI system is not actually suboptimal. Sub -optimal. So the theorem I showed you before was not a strict bound. So that order square root of delta T was not the strict bound that we thought it was. Um, we did we ran our own code where we set all the physical parameters for the FSI system equal to one. So that's the density, the Lame parameters, the viscosity, everything is one. Um, and we ran it for a lot of refinement or as much as my little laptop could do. And we got nearly first order, which was a huge surprise. We really were shocked. It was a little bit slow in one of our terms, but 
we are confident that if we continue to refine it, you would get that first order convergence. We're confident because we can prove it. We can use a variation of the proof for the parabolic hyperbolic system, and you get that it converges order delta t times that one plus log over log of one over delta t. Uh, we haven't published these results yet. We are preparing it for publication, so stay tuned for that. Um, and this is really exciting because you know I here I was thinking that if I could get a first order scheme, I'd be happy. My thesis would be done, but I apparently started with a nearly first order scheme. Um, but why are we only realizing that it's nearly optimal now? Why did we think it was half order for so long? Because people have been working on this problem for a very long time. Uh, it turns out that a lot of the previous numerical um, tests have been done on problems that are really, um, are supposed to be very applicable to a real life system. Um, and this robin robin scheme is super sensitive to the physical parameters. So the original tests were done with LMA parameters that were on the order of 10 to the six, which is huge. Um, and so that led everyone to think it was a half order method, for kind of but it's also reasonable because 10 to the six is a, a, um, is a value for the LMA parameters that you would see in a real problem that you would apply it to. So they saw it half order, probably half order then. And then when people tested it on smaller LMA parameters, the convergence can be very slow at times. And so once you see half order, you think maybe I'll stop here because that matches the other results. So it wasn't wasn't at all an unreasonable thing to assume it was half order. We just, you know, we just tested it so many times that we found the real results. Um, it's, as I said, they were tested on 10 to the six and some terms converge slowly. They need more resolution. Uh, so Miguel Fernandez um, ran some of the original experiments from the 2014 paper. And he you know, started with the 10 to the six and you're seeing that half order convergence. These are all for different values of alpha. When you made it five times lower, all those different values of alpha really start to become closer to that first order convergence. And you really see it when you decrease just 10 times lower and your limit parameters get small enough that you're, you're recovering that first order convergence. It just turns out that they were too high and they were delaying the convergence of the system. So it was very exciting to see. So now I've got a first, a nearly first order method and I thought I had a half order one, so I'm very happy. Uh, but it is really sensitive to parameters, so it's not ideal. We're still suffering from that issue because I still want to be able to use it in a real life simulation. Uh, so next steps is to try and get a second order one, which I, you know, I thought was going to be well after my thesis was done that I would get there. So maybe maybe we'll get something now. Um, but also to address this sensitivity, that's our another step. So stay tuned for those. Hopefully we'll have some nice results there. And with that, Davey the dog would like to know if you have questions. Um, Fran, I think you're muted. Well, thank you uh, for the talk. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Uh,